Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here for an evening with uh, Bradford Pearson to discuss his new book out in paperback actually yesterday, The Eagles of Heart Mountain. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm with the library shop. We are a nonprofit book and gift shop inside the Central Library. We sell new books and gifts catering to library lovers and literary nerds. Uh, we all our proceeds support the San Diego Public Library system, including the proceeds from the sale of this book. So if you click the green link below, that will take us to uh, the Library Shop website where you can purchase a copy of tonight's book, libraryshopsd.org. Again, all the proceeds support the San Diego Public Library system, all 36 br branches, excuse me. Uh, we are owned and operated by the San Diego Public Library Foundation. So the foundation is a nonprofit organization that fundraises and advocates for the entire San Diego Public Library system. So we're actually about to enter our 20th year of existence and we've raised over $130 million for your library so far. Uh, so we support programming system-wide, often supporting things that people assume the city budget covers, but because our library is woefully underfunded, uh, a lot of things actually aren't paid for by the budget. So for example, San Diego Public Library has one of the lowest per capita materials budgets of any major library system in the country. In fact, until the city council made a small increase in the most recent materials budget, uh, in response to advocacy work that the foundation did in partnership with the Friends of the San Diego Public Library, uh, before that increase, San Diego was dead last in materials budget per capita among the major library systems in America. So we still have a long ways to go. Uh, the foundation is also able to fund innovative programs and react quickly as library needs change. So for example, during the pandemic, we were able to help facilitate the printing of PPE for healthcare workers out of our innovation lab at the Central Library using the 3D printers there. Uh, we also were able to uh, fund, help fund laptops for the courtyard so that the most vulnerable patrons still had internet access while the libraries were closed. Uh, so we have a lot of needs at the San Diego Public Library. And while the foundation is always happy to find new donors, uh, one of the key things that we do is we advocate for the library. So it makes a big difference uh, and it's something you can easily do with just a few minutes of your time. Last year, we had advocates fill out postcards, send them to their city council representatives, and we flooded City Hall with these postcards. If any of you uh, are into watching budget hearings, you saw a few council people held up stacks of postcards they received from the foundation and our supporters and advocates. And it made a big difference. We were able to avoid $6 million in cuts to the library budget last year. But every year there is a new budget fight. And uh, if you're passionate about the library and want to cause some good trouble, please join us in the fight by visiting supportmylibrary.org. So tonight's program uh, is going to be a author talk. And if you have questions, we're going to answer them as the event goes on. So instead of putting them in the chat, if you could, you'll see on the screen below me here, it says, ask a question. So if you could just click that, type your question, and we'll kind of keep a running tally of them and make sure they get answered throughout the event. Again, check out the call to action button. There'll be info to uh, purchase the book, and I'll put some other links in during the event. So keep an eye on that area. and. Uh, I just want to let you know that tonight's event with Bradford Pearson is part of the San Diego Public Library's season-long series of programs called The Rebellious Misbreed, San Diego Public Library and the Japanese American Incarceration. I'll put a link in the chat to the full schedule of misbreed programs, but there's two that I want to point out to you that are coming up soon. The first is the inaugural civil breed, uh, inaugural Claire breed, Civil Liberties Memorial Lecture, which will be in person a week from today at the Central Library. I think my postcard's backwards because I'm uh, living in a virtual world, but I'll keep going. Uh, the lecture features Academy Award-winning uh, nominated filmmaker, Renee Tejima Pena, 
And uh, there's also another virtual event that's going to happen here on this Crowdcast channel December 1st with author Dan Daniel James Brown. It is the book Facing the Mountain. Uh, so that'll be Wednesday, December 1st, also moderated by Kristen, who will, we will meet in a moment. First, let me give you some quick background about the rebellious Miss Breed. So Claire Breed is our most beloved former librarian here at the San Diego Public Library System. Uh, I like to say she's the Michael Jordan of San Diego librarians. She was our city librarian for 25 years and was the primary force behind getting the new central library built. And by new central, I mean the one that opened in 1955 on 8th and East. So we now call it the old central library. But uh, she's also chiefly remembered today for her courage to stand up for social justice throughout her career, including in 1941, when after the attack on Pearl Harbor, many of the young patrons she served as the then children's librarian were hauled away and incarcerated with their families. Before they were removed, Clara Breed gave the children self-addressed stamped postcards and told them to write her for whatever they needed. She corresponded with them throughout their incarceration, sent them books and other supplies. She visited many of them in Poston and publicly advocated for their rights, publishing articles and lobbying members of Congress. At the time, she was criticized for speaking out, even sadly by other librarians across the country, but today she is an example to everyone here at the San Diego Public Library as we continue to fight for equity and justice for all. And we often ask ourselves, what would Clara do? So she received over 300 letters from the children. And though none of her letters to the camp survived, near the end of her life, Clara Breed was able to give the letters to one of the children she corresponded with, Elizabeth Yamada, who eventually donated them to the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. Facsimiles of the letters are currently on display in the Central Library's art gallery as part of the Clara Breed program. Uh, but they're also, they've been fully digitally scanned and they're available on the Japanese American National Museum's website. So speaking of the museum, I would like to bring up our moderator. Uh, Kristen Hayashi is a director of collections management and access and curator at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. Her interest in her family history has inspired her academic and professional pursuits. Since earning a PhD in history from the University of California, Riverside, much of her academic and public history work is focused on documenting the Japanese American experience in Southern California. So Kristen, take it away. Thank you for uh, moderating this event. And I'll see you guys uh, at the end. Okay. Thank you, Scott, for that great introduction. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Kristen Hayashi. I work here at the Japanese American National Museum. And we were so pleased to partner with the city of San Diego and the San Diego Public Library um, on a loan of some of the Miss Breed letters um, to uh, the, the library for the Rebellious Miss Breed exhibition. Um, so tonight, in partnership, um, we're doing this program. Um, to learn more about the book, The Eagles of Heart Mountain. So I'm very pleased now to introduce the author, Bradford Pearson. Bradford Pearson is the former features editor of Southwest, the magazine. He has written for the New York Times, Esquire, Time, and Salon, among many other publications. He grew up in Hyde Park, New York, and now lives in Philadelphia. So it's a little late for him <laughs> tonight. Um, the Eagles of Heart Mountain is his first book. So welcome. Brad, he'll talk a little bit about his book and then um, I'll be in conversation. Uh, but as Scott mentioned, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to put them um, in the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them um, throughout the program. So, Great, Brad. thanks to uh, Kristen and Scott for, uh, first of all, for hosting all of these events um, connected with Clara Breed and for having me tonight. Um, I thought that we would start tonight with an excerpt from uh, the Eagles of Heart Mountain. So part of the chapter that I'm going to read tonight is about a football game that takes place the first season that the Eagles play in Wyoming. And Chris and I will get a little bit more into the background of the football team and uh, how, unfortunately, uh, these 10,000 plus uh, Japanese Americans and their families ended up in this terrible corner of Wyoming. Uh, but I thought that I would um, 
talk a little bit about this one game against a team from Carbon County, Montana. The 1,100 person student body filled the sidelines once again. If the Warland game was expected to be a blowout in favor of the visitors, the fans, coaches, and players had no idea what to expect from the team from Red Lodge. The county's location on the state line meant the Coyotes split their games, half Montana teams, half Wyoming teams. No one at Heart Mountain knew anything about the Smith Mine disaster or the fact that most of the Coyotes were off in the South Pacific aboard a Navy ship. All they knew was that the team had lost to Cody the week before, which didn't stop the Sentinel sports editors from confidently announcing, quote, with Babe Nomura leading the attack from his tailback position, the Heart Mountain 11 is favored to take the Red Lodge Prepsters by a three touchdown margin. The teams lined up under a 78 degree sky and the Carbon County kicker sent the ball deep. Keechee took the ball at the 10 yard line and ran diagonally across the field, heading to the left sideline. Babe faked as a blocker, then sprinted toward Keechee. The pitch was flawless. Babe cradled the ball, looked downfield and saw nothing but open dirt. Arms pumping as the dust kicked up beneath him, he was gone. Gone from that field, gone from camp, gone from Wyoming. Remove the barracks and the barbed wire and the military police. Add some bleachers and sketch in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel looming over the field. Replace the stones with grass, color in the green of the palm trees and the white of the wobbly Hollywood sign watching from Mount Lee. Replace all the bad with all the good, and for those seconds, he can be just a boy doing what he loves most. Babe strode into the end zone untouched. Out of either pity or kindness, Tubby and Thompson pulled the first team. In went Tazo and Stan and the others, second and third stringers determined to fight their way into the starting lineup. Their baptism was beset by penalties, holding, clipping, offsides, spending too much time in the huddle. The first two were the result of carelessness, but the latter two were more understandable. Eleven teens who'd never played the sport before, on a stage in front of 4,000 of their peers and neighbors. The anxiety and indecisiveness could be forgiven. Despite their nerves, in the second quarter, backup quarterback Billy Shundo marched the Eagles down the field. The drive ended on a 20-yard strike to a wide-open Masuchita in the end zone. The first stringers returned for the second half and kicked off to the Coyotes. It didn't take long for the ball to be back in Babe's hands. Standing on the Coyote 47, he called a play for himself. Horse cleared the way at left tackle. Babe cut up to the middle and went untouched again through the back of the end zone. Up 19 to nothing, Tubby decided to try another one of his new plays on the Eagles' next offensive possession. At 5 feet 11 inches, Horse was the tallest player on the Eagles. On a team mainly of teenage boys between 5 feet 5 inches and 5 feet 8 inches, this should have meant he'd either play quarterback or another position where his height could be used in passing and catching situations. But Horse lacked one thing, any real ability with his hands. He couldn't throw or even catch. He couldn't shoot a basketball particularly well nor hurl a baseball. The only thing he could do well with his hands was throw a punch. On the football field, he could block, and that was about it. Still, Tubby saw a chance to use horse's size. On the next offensive possession, Yoichi snapped the ball to Babe, who faked a run up the middle. Babe wheeled around, pitching the ball to Horse, who'd peeled off from left tackle and was breaking downfield with a head of steam. As the Coyotes collapsed on him, he lateraled to Maso Gamachi, drifting wide right. The 20-yard gain was nullified by a penalty, but the message was clear. We're going to play our style of football. In the waning minutes of the third quarter, the Coyotes punted from deep in their own territory. Kichi ran it back 38 yards for the fourth and final touchdown. The Eagles starters took the field for only six plays the entire afternoon. They walked off with the 25 to nothing win. After the game, Babe was interviewed by the high school newspaper. When asked about his prowess, not only on the football field, but the basketball court and the baseball diamond, he would only say that he knew, quote, a little bit about ping pong. Thanks for reading that excerpt. I think you piqued our curiosity. So maybe we should just take a step back. Um, you know, you mentioned football, you mentioned some names, Babe Nomura and um, George Horse Yoshinaga, right? Um, but um, maybe I'll start with, I'm sitting here at the Japanese American National Museum in front of a barracks uh, that's from Heart Mountain, Wyoming, one of um, America's concentration camps. And, um, you know, just thinking about your book, maybe we should provide some context. I think, you know, the title suggests football, and that is the hook and also the through line throughout the book. But I think your book provides a really um, thorough and in-depth overview of the World War II incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans. I think you talk about the how, you know, how the forced removal and subsequent incarceration happened and became a reality. So I wonder if maybe for our audience who's not as familiar with the history, you might just give a brief overview of, you know, how 
Babe and, and George ended up in Heart Mountain, what the series of event, events were leading up to sure. that. Um, so uh, when I started this project, I was fairly ignorant of Japanese American history, and in particular, the, the history of how Japanese American incarceration came to pass. And I think that for most Americans, we think of this event, Pearl Harbor, we think of this one day in American history that sort of led to um, th this, this incarceration of 120,000 people of, of Japanese descent in the United States. What I tried to do with the book was show that while that event is what led to this, there were decades and decades of, uh, of policies and racism that led up to it, especially on the West Coast. So in California, Oregon, and Washington, you had years and years of ranchers and farmers who had grown increasingly um, uh, jealous of, of the value that Japanese farmers brought to the West Coast. So when uh, Japanese immigrants first came to the West Coast, they came uh, as laborers, uh, as many immigrants do at first, but pretty quickly established themselves as the dominant agricultural force uh, in the Western United States. And because of that, they started to sort of displace the, uh, the, the value and the supremacy of the white farmers on the West Coast. So that's all happening at the beginning of the 20th century. And then once that starts happening, the, that, that sort of fervor and that anger trickles its way up to local politics, state politics, and eventually sort of finds its way um, as World War II starts and as uh, suspicion of uh, Japanese and Japanese Americans begins to grow, that sort of, um, that racism, that xenophobia that led to uh, all the anger on the West Coast eventually makes its way up into the War Department. And uh, that means it, it ends up with, with two men named Carl Benditson and John DeWitt, who um, for very little reason other than sort of blind racism, uh, hatched this plan to remove Japanese and Japanese Americans from the West Coast of the United States. And they do that in a way that gives, um, sort of puts the onus on individual military commanders. So DeWitt was in charge of the West Coast. Then you also had military commanders who were um, who were in charge of parts all across the United States, the Eastern Seaboard, the Midwest. There was a separate military commander for Hawaii. So by sort of breaking it down into these regions, they allowed military commanders to, uh, to, to, to basically decide for themselves if they thought, quote, the, the Japanese problem was really a problem for, their, um, for, for the region that they were in charge of. And DeWitt, again, sort of, <laughs> I hate, someone asked me the other day, they're like reading the book and they were like, so it is all just racism? And I'm like, well, yeah, a lot of it sort of just sort of shakes out to racism. And DeWitt um, basically saw, he ignored all the intelligence reports that came from Naval Intelligence, that came from the FBI, that came from the War Department that said, that Japanese Americans on the West Coast would not be a problem from an espionage or sabotage standpoint. He ignored all of those and put Executive Order 9066, which Benditson wrote and got to the desk of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, he put that into action on the West Coast. And that's why you don't have mass incarceration of Japanese Americans who lived in Utah or Chicago or Colorado, or even more specifically, the tens of thousands of uh, Japanese Americans who lived in Hawaii at that point, um, which had the highest concentration of ethnically Japanese in the United States. Um, so that's sort of the 90 second to two minute version of, of what got us to the camps. Um, and then basically it was once Executive Order 9066 uh, was signed into law and DeWitt enacted it and DeWitt and Benditson sort of put it into motion on the West Coast. Um, it was a mess. The, the, the federal government had no real plan for where they're going to put these 120,000 people. Uh, they first put them in temporary centers up and down the West Coast, so in uh, horse tracks and fairgrounds, and then basically had them sitting there while they finished building these permanent concentration camps, um, which were also across the West in, in Arkansas, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, California, Idaho. Um, so that's sort of gets us up to uh, Heart Mountain, which is uh, part of the namesake of the book. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's such an important point that you say that it wasn't just Pearl Harbor that 
um, started this chain of events that it's, it was decades of de jure and de facto discrimination mm -hmm. against Japanese immigrants and their descendants. I think that is so key, very important. And another important point that you make is on one of the first pages and you had a note on terminology. Um, so I wonder if maybe you can explain, you know, why scholars of um, this experience, you know, talk or use the terms um, incarceration and concentration camp rather than internment. Yeah, um, sort of getting back to my own ignorance when I first started on this project, you know, when you're when you're a kid and you're learning about the subject, I grew up in New York. Um, so I think that the experience of Japanese Americans is kind of removed, uh, especially if you grow up on the East Coast from your, your day to day life and especially from your, your history lessons. And even the amount of history that we learn on this, it's the term is Japanese internment which I say very early on in the book is wrong on, on both levels in that these were Japanese Americans for the most part that were incarcerated. The Japanese that were incarcerated during this time period, um, they had no uh, ability to become US citizens at that point because they were not allowed to become citizens. Japanese were not allowed to become citizens of the United States at that point. So, uh, so the first word, just Japanese is incorrect. And then the term internment, um, wasn't even used during the time to describe this. It was later used as a sort of a catch-all phrase that um, people started using in the 50s to sort of describe what this experience was for Japanese Americans. At the time, if you look at how Roosevelt described this, he called these concentration camps. He didn't use a euphemism. He called them concentration camps. And um, after the war, obviously, the term concentration camp basically became synonymous with uh, extermination camps uh, across Europe by the Nazis. So there was sort of a couple different forces at work where it was people were not trying to conflate the Japanese American camps with extermination camps, but were also finding trying to sort of find a way to soften what happened to Japanese Americans. And um, the reason that I don't use internment in the book is because when I started this book, I knew that as somebody who is not a member of the Japanese American community, as someone who is not Japanese American, I needed to be respectful of the terminology that the Japanese American community um, and this generation of scholars is using. And that is incarceration, concentration camps, and using the proper terminology. So I always defer to Densho, which is a uh, nonprofit organization in Seattle that has sort of tasked itself with educating um, Americans of, of all ages about the Japanese American incarceration experience in these concentration camps. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's basically, you know, I, I don't, whenever someone uses the term Japanese internment now, I just sort of, I don't get offended. I just use it as an opportunity to sort of explain why that uh, is not a terminology that that is used today and, and something that um, I sort of use as, as a learning experience to sort of teach people like how words change and how they can matter in different contexts. Right, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting when you look at the exclusion posters, the terminology mm -hmm. is so interesting because it'll say things like, um, you know, aliens and non-aliens. So again, as you mentioned, Japanese immigrants were not able to become citizens because of discriminatory immigration legislation. Right. until 1952. Um, so they were considered aliens ineligible for citizenship. But the non-aliens, that's a euphemism, right? right? It means citizen. It's, it's American. But I think yeah. when you, yeah, exactly, American. But when you see that initially, you're like, oh, alien, yes. And yeah. then, you know, I think that's where the hysteria comes into play. Yeah, um, but you sort of matter. have to like, even now you have to think like, oh, what do they mean by this? What is, what are they actually trying to say? Because like, you could just breeze over that and assume that aliens means you know, folks from uh, other countries, Japanese nationals or whatever that is, but then non-aliens, if you're just sort of casually thinking about it, you're like, oh, that must be some other category of, of, of some other folks from another country or something. And so you actually like break down what those words mean and put them together. You know, it's basically just them saying, oh, we just want another terminology, another term to use to sort of define this subset of Americans when they really are just Americans. Right. And to justify the government's actions, too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which is also interesting. You know, I think when we describe the forced removal and, and subsequent incarceration, we think of, um, you know, it's the federal government's actions is what we usually say. We'll say things like the federal government um, 
you know, issued instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry, but you've really personalized, um, I think, the actions by providing really in-depth portraits of like the individuals that are, you know, um, I guess designed this whole um, incarceration project. So, um, you know, you talk about these historical actors like DeWitt and Benditson, and, and I'm wondering what your strategy was for, was it to show that individuals can wield a lot of power to show their hubris? What, what was your, your thinking behind that? Yeah, I think that a lot of times you can kind of, when you're reading a, a history book, you can kind of just sort of glaze over these people's names and you could just sort of say like, oh, this person did this that led to executive order 9066 or led to whatever, the invasion of Iraq or whatever this different historical event is. You can sort of like put these people's names in your head and just say like, oh yeah, like Roosevelt did this. And it's like, yes, Roosevelt did this, but here's the people that created that. And I thought that if I added enough personal context to these people, those names would sink in. So if you heard Carl Benditson down the road in some of their context, you would say, oh, that's the architect of Japanese American incarceration or DeWitt. You'd say, oh, that's the guy who put that into action on the West Coast. And I think that by adding some of their personal life to it, you could sort of see some of the contradictions within their decisions. So Benditson grows up in this logging community in Washington um, with lots and lots of different kinds of people, with Finns and Lithuanians um, and uh, East Asian immigrants that live all in this community, in this logging community. Um, and then he is also trying to escape from something. He changes his own name from the Jewish spelling of Benditson with an S-O-N at the end to a more Nordic sounding S-E-N to sort of mask his own identity in this time frame. Like he does this during the war um, to sort of hide his own Jewishness as he's climbing the ranks. Um, and I think that there's something, I don't know, if, I, I don't wanna say it's necessarily a positive thing, but it, I wanted to add some sort of human layers to Benditson and DeWitt, not necessarily positive layers, but to sort of show these people as three-dimensional characters who are making, they're not making these decisions in a vacuum. They have had life experiences that um, have somehow led them to make this terrible decision. Um, and I think the thing about DeWitt is that DeWitt was just kind of a lackey. He, he kind of just rose the ranks through the military. Um, he was a quartermaster. He had all of these roles that were just sort of, he just sort of kept fumbling his way up. And, um, and it, I, I'm going to fumble the exact quote, but basically DeWitt was known as a person who was basically beholden to the last strong personality that he came in contact with. So whatever the last strong personality was that he met, he was always trying to mimic that sort of person. And that just so happened to be at that moment, Carl Benditson. And when Benditson decided to start crafting executive order 9066, he found um, a welcome ear in DeWitt on the West Coast. Yeah, so interesting. Um, so in addition to creating these in-depth portraits of people like DeWitt and Benditson, you also create in-depth portraits of some of your main characters, including Babe, um, no, Mara. And so I'm just sort of wondering how you came um, to the story of the Eagles of Heart Mountain. So football, how you became interested in Heart Mountain and just the whole incarceration uh, topic, I guess. Yeah. So in 2014, I was in Wyoming for a totally separate story. I was writing a story about Yellowstone for a magazine in Texas called Cowboys and Indians. So I was in Northwest Wyoming and um, one of the people that I was on this trip with, um, one of the other people on this reporting trip was like, oh, you know, would anyone be interested in going to visit the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center? Um, Heart Mountain is about, I think about 60 miles east of the eastern entrance of Yellowstone. And I said, yeah, sure, that, that sounds interesting. I, I'd love to, you know, learn more about this. I walked in with, you know, sort of thinking that I, I had a good handle on this history and walked out incredibly embarrassed by how little I knew about Japanese American incarceration. Um, but while I was in the museum, there's a, there's a display about high school life in the camp. And there were two small sentences about the Heart Mountain Eagles football team. And I went back to Texas and I wrote the story about Yellowstone, but I kept thinking about these two sentences about this football team. And I kept thinking like, this is football team of this camp. Uh, and I won't give away what the sentences were because they give away the end of the book. But uh, I was like, this is football team and they're really good. And they were in this camp 
and they're Japanese Americans. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. So like weeks would pass, months would pass, like a year would pass. And every reporter knows that like, if you're working on a story, but you can't stop thinking about another story, like that's actually the story you should probably be working on. So I started thinking about the Heart Mountain Eagles team and I started doing more and more research, just sort of brushing up on the story of Japanese American incarceration and like how this might happen. Like I didn't know if it was gonna be a magazine story, I didn't know if it was gonna be, I mean, podcasts were kind of starting to be a thing then. Um, so I reached out to the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center and, and the museum staff there and said, hey, you know, this is a thing that I'm kind of interested in. Um, is there anyone that I can talk to that might be able to sort of steer me in the right direction? And uh, the executive director there at the time, uh, his name is Dakota. He said, yeah, I got a guy, his name is Bacon Sakatani. He has every copy of the Heart Mountain Sentinel, which is the weekly newspaper. He has every copy of the Heart Mountain Sentinel on, uh, on his computer. And maybe if you get in contact with him, he'll send you some, some copies. I get in touch with Bacon. Bacon sends me a CD in the mail with every copy of the Heart Mountain Sentinel, every copy of the Heart Mountain High School newspaper. Um, so then, you know, I had, a, I had a full-time job, but at night I would just sort of sit up and start reading through the Sentinels over and over and over again. And the thing that the Sentinel did, um, the Heart Mountain Sentinel was by far the most professional newspaper in all of the camps. Uh, they, had a, they had a great staff. That I had a staff full of people who worked in newspapers before they were incarcerated. Um, so they also had like an awesome sports department, which is a crazy thing to say about a newspaper in an American concentration camp, but they had a really good sports section. So they had uh, reporters, they had a columnist, they had box scores for every single game that the Eagles played. So I just sort of started reading through those and started trying to figure out who might be the people that were on the team that I would need if I really wanted to tell a story about this football team. And that's when names like Babe Namora, Kichi Ikeda, uh, George Horse Yoshinaga, um, and names like that started sort of rising to the top and being like, okay, these are the guys that were sort of the, the best players and the players that show up the most in these box scores and in these games. Um, and then from there, I sent a sort of fateful email to Babe Namora's daughter, Jan Mori. I found her email address somewhere on LinkedIn, I think, and just said, you don't know me. Um, feel free to ignore this email, but uh, I'm kind of interested in talking about your dad and his history in this camp. And Jan reached out to me and we talked. And then for some reason, still to this day, uh, I still think about it. Um, I still don't know why she said yes. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, she said, okay. And then the project was sort of off and going from there. There's so many things you just said there that I'd love to sort of follow <laughs> up on. A Sorry. fun tangent would be these nicknames of, oh, yeah. when you say nicknames like um, Babe and Horse and Horse. Bacon. <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe we could talk a little bit about just your research because mm -hmm. you have just these very detailed, you know, play by plays of games. And I'm just wondering, like, how much information was in the Sentinel? How much did you sort of have to just piece together from your knowledge of football? Or you know, what was your research yeah. process like, I guess? Yeah. So, um, so the, the stuff that happens in camp was a much different process from this, the research that I had to do before camp. So I'll focus on camp to begin with. And that was a lot of that comes from the Heart Mountain Sentinel. I read every single copy of the Sentinel from start to finish, not just the sports stuff. Um, because I knew that in order to make this book as good as it possibly could be, I couldn't just put these kids on this football field. I had to put them in the context of the high school there. Then I had to put them in the context of the barracks. I had to put them in the context of this whole camp and what it meant to be in this camp for a year of your life, two years of your life, three years of your life or more. Um, and that's why I wanted to know as much as I possibly could about life at heart mount so that was in the sentinel that was going through old um oral histories that folks from heart mountain had done so horse had done one um stanny gawa had done one um and some of the other players had also done some and then i also just went through and listened to and read the transcripts of all the other heart mountain incarcerates that had given oral histories um and i especially focused on people who were teenagers in camp 
because I knew that I needed to create this sort of fuller image of what it was like to be a teenager in camp. Um, one thing that drew me to the story of the Eagles was sort of the universality of being a teenager and that all of us have been teenagers and we all understand what it's like to be a teenager, whether it's the, the good things, the pitfalls, all the things that come with being a teenager. Um, so that was, I thought, an interesting way to sort of hook this story was, even though I know that the characters are teenagers, but to sort of lean into that and say, what must have been like to be a kid and to you know have to give away your sporting equipment to your white friends because you're getting sent to a concentration camp, things like that. Um, so the Sentinel oral histories interviews, um, I interviewed Kichi Ikeda, who's one of the living players, but then I was also able to interview a lot of different family members. So family members from the Yoshinagas, Demoras, and Igawa family, um, and then other people who were just in camp at the time. Um, I was able to interview the son of the, uh, the white, sort of athletic director for the camp and he got a sense of what their view was and what how sort of sports played a role in camp um and then the rest of the book uh outside of heart mountain i mean there's obviously there's a lot of um academic work and a lot of scholarship that has gone on to heart mountain mike Mackey has written a ton of books about heart mountain i read all of them um each one of them is on this shelf somewhere here uh with a ton of post-it notes and flags and dog ears all through it. Um, when I, the first time I ever went up to Wyoming to do research, I met with Mike and he handed me a bunch of binders that his wife was going to throw out uh, about uh, some of the old, like old Xerox copies of stuff that he had that was incredibly helpful. Um, and then I knew that in order to tell this story, the sort of smaller story of the Eagles, I needed to know, like, so in order to tell this story, I need to know, like, this much information about the Japanese American life and, and about what that meant from the first time that uh, a, a Japanese person set foot in the United States until that day before Pearl Harbor. I wanted to know as much as I possibly could so that I could sit there and write authoritatively and know that what I was writing was not only accurate, but that I had it so well instilled in my brain that I wasn't constantly just like flipping through books and papers to try to make sure that I had every single thing accurate. Um, obviously, like if you look at the book, it's a 400 page book, but only 300 of it are the actual stories. So there's like a hundred pages mm -hmm. of footnotes. Um, so I worked really hard to like try to make sure that each one of those sentences was accurate. And that meant that after I got my book deal, I think for three months, I didn't write. I just sat on my couch every day and read. So I read books, oral histories, Sentinel, um, everything I could get my hands on, um, you know, academic research, journals, anything I could. Um, I've read letters. I've read Stanley Hayami's letters. So I know you guys have an exhibit at JNM right now about Stanley's letters. Um, yeah, I mean, the research was just, you know, finding everything I possibly could. Um, I've read bad books about Japanese American incarceration. I've read really good books about it. And I thought, I don't know if how I'm going to do this. Um, but I really, I wanted to read the bad books too, because I wanted to see what I didn't want to do <laughs> and see what didn't work in those books. Because I knew that um, in this subject, there's, there's a lot of academic work about it. And there's a lot of um, memoirs, but there aren't as many narrative stories that tell the story of Japanese American incarceration by following characters that the writer isn't related to or isn't a member of their family. Um, right. So I knew that in this space, there weren't as many books so that I knew that I had to do a good job because I thought that more people would read it because it was something that was a little bit different in this, uh, in the, in this place right now. Um, so I kind of, took that and it kind of made me sick every day thinking about uh, screwing the story up. So um, I hope I didn't. <laughs> no, I mean, your research is very impressive. Um, so on a related note, we have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is, I'm curious what the newspaper coverage of the team was like in newspapers outside of the camp when the team beat their local high school. Yeah, that's a great question. So I spent a lot of time trying to find as many stories as I could about that because I wanted to see 
that context. I wanted to see what it was like um, in Cody or Powell or in Casper. Um, and a lot of times it was just sort of a small little blurb. And that was sort of the, so the first season that the Eagles played, they played a couple games and everyone was willing to come into camp and so, you know, sort of at first people were res- reticent to, to schedule the Eagles because they didn't want to send their teams to this camp of who they considered to be maybe dangerous Japanese Americans for literally no reason. But, um, and then the second season, it was hard to book teams because the first season the Eagles beat everyone. So no one wanted to lose to a team um, of Japanese Americans. Uh, so the newspaper f- coverage kind of reflects that in that there's very little written about it in any of these other newspapers. Sometimes it's just a blurb or a mention that a game is coming up. Um, the very last game that the team plays is against um, one of the best teams in the state of Wyoming is a team from Casper. And they get a little bit more coverage in the Casper paper, mostly because Casper is a bigger city, but also because this football team is one of the most dominant teams in Wyoming state history. Uh, and you also see it in uh, you know the lack of after the first season and after the second season, no Eagles were ever named to the all state teams, which are voted on by the newspaper reporters from across the state. So you have a team that is dominating across Wyoming and across Southern Montana, but none of the players are recognized for any of their efforts by any of these newspapers. So I think that that sort of says where these newspapers were at and that it was like, they didn't want to give any coverage to this team. And then they also didn't want to give them any credit for how good they actually were. So, so much of, of what I got was just from the Sentinel and the Sentinel and the high school newspaper there. And they were, um, you know, a lot of times when you look at something like that, you have to sort of take things with a grain of salt as to how it was edited, how it was written. But by the second game, the columnists for the Hart Matt and Sentinel were incredibly critical of the Hart Mountain Eagles for whether it was a lack of effort or penalties. So once I started realizing that, I was like, okay, I feel like this is kind of a non-biased source here. Like they, they expect so much of these teenagers. They expect so much of this football team that their coverage has almost gone from being uh, too kind and sort of being, you know, patting them on the back to being too critical. So I was able to kind of find a middle ground there and what I thought the team uh, what their success actually was. And, and again, there was a, a sports reporter who covered every game. There was a reporter who gave a preview of the next week's game. There was a sports columnist and there were full box scores of every game in the Sentinel, which you can't, you, you don't get that for most high school games today. You know, never mind uh, in 19, in the fall of 1943 in a concentration camp. And and these games were a big deal. I mean, you you make that point. And I think you said that the attendance for one of these games was like 4,000 people. Mm-hmm. And and the population of the Heart Mountain concentration camp was about 10,000, right? So, I mean, that's right. a huge portion of, of the population there. Um, I was wondering if, I know you interviewed, was it a descendant of one of the opponents of the yeah. Eagles? Yeah. Did, were the players impacted, these opponents, you know, were they right. impacted by um, being at Heart Mountain in this you know, American concentration camp and did, did it change their impression of Japanese Americans and you know, what yeah, was I'm, I'm, going on? Yeah, unfortunately I wasn't able to get as much on that as I would have liked when I first started out. It was hard to find a lot of these players, a lot of the best players from the outside the school. A lot of them had died and a lot of their fam- some of their families didn't respond to me, which I totally understand. Um, so it was hard to kind of put that into the context that I, that I wanted in the book that I think would have made the book a little bit better. Um, but when I talked to uh, Leroy Pierce's son, he, you know, basically just said his dad was great and his dad didn't talk much about this event. Um, but even if you look at some of the small things that are going on in the Sentinel, the small little blurbs about what the opposing teams did afterwards, they would go and they would have dances on uh, in the camp, they would go to they would attend dances, or they would go to dinner with um, some of the other some of the some of the other folks from the camp, not necessarily the players, but some of the other people in the camp. So there were like little things that I tried to add in to give them a little bit of context. I wish I had I I, I do wish that I had more ability to add more context of what it was like for these kids to come into camp because I think that that was that must have been an incredible moment too. Like if you grew up in a small town in Wyoming with 1500 people in it 
and all of a sudden you go into a camp of 11,000, 12,000 people, four or 5,000 people are lining a football field. And maybe you've never seen a Japanese American in your entire life. If you grow up in one of these small towns, um, or you've never had any real interaction with them, if you have, that must have been sort of a bizarre experience for those kids too. And, you know, I don't want to both sides that, but that must have been, if you're 16 years old and you get your football team schedules a game and you have to go through barbed wire and go past guys holding guns to go play this game, that has to have some sort of impact on not only your life as a teenager, but when you look back on uh, your time later on. And I really do. That's, I have a few uh, small things that I wish that I'd been able to accomplish with the book that I wasn't able to, but, um, you know, say la vie. <laughs> There's another uh, question from the audience. Were, were there also base, was there also a baseball team in addition to football? Um, have had always heard a lot about baseball in the camps. Yeah. So baseball in the camps was huge. And there were so many times when I was writing this book where people are like, you should really just write a book about baseball. Like baseball was a lot more popular in the camps. Um, and that's why I didn't write a book about baseball. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I think that baseball was the very first thing that they did at Heart Mountain was they they cleared a field and, and put in a baseball field. So at Heart Mountain, at Gila River, especially um, at Gila River, there was a, a man there who was a, a sort of a Japanese league on the West Coast. Uh, it was a real legend there. And he created a massive baseball league at Gila River. And then at Heart Mountain, they had multiple leagues for kids, adults. They would play in huge tournaments with seven, eight, 10 team leagues over the course of the year. And then actually, at one point, they created a Heart Mountain All-Star team and a Gila River All-Star team. And they convinced the WRA and camp administrators to be able to send each of them to the other camps. So Heart Mountain visited, Gila River visited Heart Mountain to play baseball. And then the next year, Heart Mountain visited Gila River. They got on buses and drove from Wyoming to Arizona. Um, I would have loved to see some, uh, something in the historic record as to how that conversation went to convince them to allow them to do this. Um, but basically they said, we'll sell enough tickets that we'll pay for all of our costs. And they were right. They filled up all of the, the bleachers in Gila River and in Heart Mountain. Um, so yeah, so baseball, baseball was huge. Um, and football was big at, at Heart Mountain. It was, it wasn't as big at the other camps, but it was big at Heart Mountain. And that was a combination of a couple of things and that Heart Mountain had incredible players. Heart Mountain had Babe Nomura, who I think was the best Japanese American player of his generation, had Tosha Sano, who was a few years older than Babe, but also played junior college football and would have played division one football if, uh, if he hadn't been sent to camp. Um, and you have a bunch of other players who played in, in junior college and on the West Coast that really created a football atmosphere at Heart Mountain that didn't exist at some of the other camps, purely based on, on the, the talent that they had at Heart Mountain. Yeah, I mean, sports was so big in the Japanese American community before the war. Um, we had an exhibition here at Janum years ago that was called More Than a Game and it was about sports. And the curator of that exhibition, Brian Nia, uh, in the companion book for the exhibition talked about how Issei, so the Japanese immigrant generation, really encouraged their American-born children to play sports like baseball and football, um, partly because they considered these important activities to Americanize their kids, but also to keep them out of trouble. So this is well-established, you know, in the community before the war. But um, I guess I'm, I'm sort of wondering, like, Babe and and horse, like you know, they're, they're Americans, and this is just second nature for them to play sports. But do you also feel like maybe they felt they had to prove, you know, something on the field or prove that they were American, and football was a way that they did that, or is that maybe projecting? <laughs> yeah. So I the I had the exact same question the whole time. You sort of in your mind, you're like, oh, these guys are like they're playing football for something bigger than football, right? Uh, and then when I interviewed Kichi Ikeda, I sort of brought that up. I was like, you know, you guys had 4,000 people at these games. Like it was, that was the event. Like a lot of people were watching you, you know, because they a, couldn't do anything else, but I think that they hung some, some of their hopes on this football team. And he looked at me kind of puzzled and was like, no, we were just playing football. 
Uh, and I was like, well, and then I like I tried to ask it like two other ways, like into it, and the answer just coming back to they just liked playing football. And I think that 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 gets to the, to the root of all of this is that these were just American teenagers. These were American teenagers who grew up in households, yes, that were heavily Japanese. You know, George grew up with strawberry farmers and Babe grew up where his parents ran a boarding house um, for, you know, single Japanese men, single Issei. So they obviously, their home life was was very Japanese, but then they had to go to high school. So Babe went to, to Hollywood High School one of the most famous high schools in America and one of the most famous neighborhoods in America. And, you know, he was a regular, uh, all sort of a, this all American guy. He was a, a football player, a baseball player, a basketball player. Um, but even within those realms, you know, sort of getting back to Japanese Americans and sport is that a lot of the games that these kids played outside of sports were in Japanese only leagues, Japanese American only leagues. So they weren't, for the most part, because of the racism of the times, they weren't allowed to play in regular little leagues or whatever the other leagues were. So they created, um, you know, they they created their own leagues in, in basketball and baseball and track and weightlifting and all these different sports, swimming, diving, all these different sports uh, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, so, you know, these kids grew up in sort of two worlds that they grew up in the athletics of the Japanese American community, but then the ones who are really good were like, okay, well now I need to go play for Hollywood high or Mountain View high or wherever it was. And that's when they were sort of thrown into the competition of, of the whole city, as opposed to just um, the Japanese American community. Um, getting back to what you said about Brian Nia, who I interviewed for this book, um, that exhibit more than a game. I actually, when I was at Janum researching the book, I had the archivist, actually pulled the boxes from the original exhibit. So I was able to go through all the research for that exhibit to sort of get a sense of Japanese Americans in sport, not just in football, but in, you know, pretty much everything. The exhibit was incredible. Even, you know, I have the book itself. That was the, the final book that came out of it. But then I was able to go through and see all the different research that went into each part of the exhibit, which I think really helped sort of center the the history of Japanese American sports in the book and especially Japanese American football. Yeah, right. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you really wanted to establish what it was like to be, you know, a teenager um, in camp and, and to show that, you know, they had these lives before the incarceration. And so you mentioned like Babe playing for Hollywood High. And so I'm trying to tie this back to Miss Breed. <laughs> I'm just, I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if, um, Babe or George, Horse, any of any of these character, these individuals, right. um, sort of maintain friendships uh, with friends, you know, that they knew before the war, mm. uh, non-Japanese yeah. American friends. Yeah, I, I know. I, I know Babe. You know, two of Babe's best friends were these brothers from these Italian American brothers from down the street, and I know that they remain friends um, later into their life. I think George. Um, at the time he grew up sort of in a, a strawberry farmer's family in Mountain View and his community was much more insulated in terms of, you know, he, he was a farmer's son. So they, they went and they, they farmed the fields and then he went to school and then he, he came back. And then when he left camp, George moved to, to LA. So he never went back to the community that, that he was from before the war. Um, but I also know that, you know, a lot of the Eagles stayed in touch too. So you had this community where these kids, a lot of them met in camp. So George and Babe first meet at Santa Anita when they're sent to the temporary center. So George comes from the Bay Area uh, and uh, Babe comes up from LA and they meet for the first time at Santa Anita and, and they become lifelong friends. And that's what happens a lot of, at the camp too. So you had at Heart Mountain, especially, most of the folks were from LA, but you had some people from other parts of the country that got sent there. So you have these new sort of friendships that are forming um, that might not have formed back in in LA, and certainly wouldn't have formed if um, if if Horse had had stayed in Mountain View his whole life. Yeah, and that's really important to point out because there weren't that many 
individuals like Miss Breed, you know, who right. stood up for um, Japanese Americans and and advocated for them and maintained friendships. So, no, no, you. I think that the thing is, you know, we all like to think that we're the kind of person that'll stand up for our neighbors, and this is a great example of how often we fail our neighbors in need, and how often mm -hmm. we fail folks who. Um, our government or other people are sort of pushing down on. Uh, and that's something that I think about, and I think definitely think about a lot more now after I've written the book in terms of how I live my own life and how I sort of view and expect my kids to live their life and trying to live more openly um, and sort of, you know, stand up for what's right. I know that sounds like a sort of an after school special answer, yeah, but it's very uh, important. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that that's the thing that I keep thinking about. I, I, I thought about a lot because there's, there's a couple characters that a, very, a couple of small people and some other folks that I've written about um, after the book in, in other contexts that did do the right thing. Um, but you also don't want to, you know, sort of give them more credit when 99.9% .9 of white neighbors didn't watch over their Japanese American neighbor's house or didn't watch over their farm or straight up stole someone's farm or paid pennies for someone's car when they knew that this family was about to be sent to a camp and uh, had to sell all their belongings that everything that they owned in the course of three or four days before they had to get on a train and go to a camp. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know this um, there are questions here from the audience. Um, one of the questions is, did any of the players go on to play in college? Yes, I won't give too much away, but um, Babe Namora is, um, I said this, I think he's the best Japanese American football player. And a lot of folks say he's the best Japanese American athlete of that generation. Um, and he did, after he left Heart Mountain, he made his way back to Los Angeles and played first at Los Angeles, um, the junior college in LA, and then went on to play at San Jose State. Um, where he was an Associated Press All West Coast Honorable Mention player. And were it not for an uh, injury to his knee, he also got invited to play, uh, to try out for the NFL and Major League Baseball, which is uh, an accomplishment for anyone in any generation, <laughs> never mind someone who had had uh, their playing career interrupted for years by being sent unnecessarily to a concentration camp. Thank you. Yeah, there's there's so many great questions here. I know we're sort of running uh, close to the end here. Um, you know, I wanted to get to you know talking about the fair the fair play committee because okay. that's such an important aspect. But I know we're also running out of time. So Scott, what do you think? Also, we... uh, let's do let, yeah, do that one question, and then I'll I'll wrap us up with my last question, and we got and one thing. I one thing I'll add is that. Uh, if you just Google my name, you'll find my website and you'll find my Twitter handle and stuff. And that has my email address. So you have, if you have any other questions that I didn't get to answer, I'm more than happy to um, answer any of those in email. Um, it might take a couple of days, but I will get to all of them. I promise you. So There are a couple that we didn't quite get to today okay. that are very important questions and good questions. Okay. So, yeah. But Krista, Sorry. did you want to ask the last part that you wanted to ask? Well, I mean, I guess ahead, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if you wanted to just maybe briefly talk about the the fair play, the fair play committee, because I think that's really important. Um, yeah. So, um, so while everyone was in camp, um, the federal government, the War Department especially, was trying to reinstate the draft for Japanese American young men during the war. So they were trying to draft men right out of the camps and send them to the front lines in Italy and France. And the fair play committee uh, sort of said that's really bad. That's not, that's not a great idea. We don't want to do that because what happens if, if, if we go on leave, do we get sent right back to a camp? So they asked the federal government to sort of clarify their elite, clar clarify their rules. Are we Americans right now? We're Americans being held against our will in camps for no reason. If you give us our full citizenship, if you let us leave the camps, if you protect our families or take them out of the camps, we'll gladly serve in the armed forces. We are Americans and we believe in this war. We want to fight in this war as long as we're free. Uh, and the federal government didn't do that. 
So uh, 63 young men from Heart Mountain, and this eventually spread to other camps as well. Uh, basically just forewent the draft. Uh, they became draft resistors and were eventually charged and convicted in federal court and, and served time in the federal penitentiary. And the one thing I think is really important about this, and the reason I, I tie it into this story is because a lot of the Eagles are having to make this decision as to whether they have to want to resist the draft or whether they want to join the army, despite the fact that um, they're being drafted out of these camps. And the players all make very different decisions. Um, and I think each one of those decisions is, is brave in a, in a very different way. Um, but then the one thing is that it goes to show that after these young men that went to prison for their for, for draft resistance were released, some of them fought in the Korean War. So you have like, the, they had the real courage of the conviction to say, no, what we're doing right now is right and true. Um, and then they eventually proved to the federal government, even though they didn't have to, that they, they were just were right, that, that they weren't lying all along. They didn't just want to not fight. They fought in Korea, so. Another reason to read the book. But I just, I guess, wanted to end by just saying that I think, you know, you do a really good job of talking about what happens after um, the incarcerees leave camp, all of your main characters leave camp. And that's such an important point to focus on because a lot of histories about the incarceration just end in 1945. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what happens to people or how difficult it was for them to restart their lives. So just another important point and another reason to read the Eagles of Heart Mountain. So, <laughs> oh, wait, we got it's uh, bingo. Yeah, oh, there we go. Three. Oh, three that. different copies. So. Yeah, right. I've got the I've got the galley. Pretty cool. I've got the paperback that came out last week, and she has the hardcover. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, so normally these events are uh, inside the San Diego Central Library in our beautiful auditorium. So it it usually seems appropriate for me to step in and ask a final question to tie it all back to the library. So for both Kristen and Bradford, uh, how has the library impacted your life? Just the concept of a library or a personal moment you had at the library in your life? Kristen, you can go first. Such a great question. Um, <laughs> and we had like an hour to think about it. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, some of just my fondest memories of a kid as as a kid was just spending, you know, summer days in the library, our local library. Both my parents were teachers, and so that was like the only place where we could get everything we wanted. <laughs> um, and uh, I just, it was the time I got to spend with my parents, just reading. And I think that all that time at the library just really turned me into a a lifelong reader. So. Oh, libraries are so important to my life. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll sort of echo Kristen in that we all sort of, anyone who works in, in books or in words or in research has that moment that they kind of remember from when they were a little kid. Um, but then also when it comes to the research for this book, the one thing that I think that a lot of people don't know about their local library is their interlibrary loan system, which was very important for the research for this book I could basically say, oh, I need this book. And the people at the Free Library of Philadelphia would say, okay. And then a couple of weeks later, a book would show up from New Mexico or Canada or somewhere, and it's free. Uh, and you don't just have to do it if you're a researcher. Like if there's just a book that your library doesn't have, you can put it in and they'll say like, okay, like if we have to pay like a buck, would you do this? You'd say, yeah. And then you, they get some book that's, I don't know, somewhere else in the country. It's, it's this incredible system that if somebody tried to make it now in 2021, it would be like immediately voted down by every town council or government in America because it seems so such a ridiculous idea. Um, but it's incredible and everyone should use their uh, interlibrary loan systems, whether you're a researcher or just a, a lover of books. And I think that's a perfect uh, way to tie the evening together because as we discussed in the green room, Clara Breed was instrumental in creating the SARA system down here in Southern California, which is the early interlibrary loan system we had. So uh, libraries matter. Thank you for being here tonight. Bradford, thank you for writing a wonderful book. Again, available for sale at the link below. We'll always have it at the shop. Uh, Kristen, thank you for moderating a great event today. Um, 
I think I can speak for Bradford that we should have our own event where we just pick your brain for your knowledge <laughs> in the subject yeah. because it is stunning. And uh, you'll be back with us December 1st to uh, discuss Facing the Mountain by Daniel James Brown. So everybody look forward to that. And then if anybody's in San Diego, stop by in person next week at the San Diego Public Library for the inaugural Clara Breed Civil Liberties Memorial Lecture Wednesday at 6.30. Um, the sad thing about Crowdcast is when I hit end broadcast, it just ends and goes away. So uh, I can't shake hands with anybody or thank you, but <laughs> thank you everybody for being here and uh, join us again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.